World News Today, brought to you by Admiral Corporation, world's largest manufacturer of radio phonographs with automatic record changers. This program is presented in behalf of Admiral dealers all over America. By shortwave broadcast, direct from important overseas stations and leading news centers in our own country, CBS reporters are waiting to bring you first-hand news from the world's political and battlefronts. Now, here's Robert Trott. Japanese broadcasts are saying that some 80 super fortresses have made an attack today on the Tokyo district, while other American bombers raided the island of Formosa, the peninsula of Korea, and the Chinese city of Nanking, capital of the puppet government. Allied headquarters in Manila does report that Philippine-based American bombers attacked Formosa, but there is no Allied confirmation of the other raids which the enemy mentions nor has any word yet come from any Allied source regarding the fleet movements which the Japanese continue to announce. Today, the latest story from the enemy is that the Allied task force is attempting to approach Kyushu, the southernmost Japanese home island. The fighting on Okinawa is still intensely bitter, but the latest reports from correspondents at the front there say that Japanese artillery fire is beginning to slacken along the battle line at the southern end of the island. A Chungking communique announces that the Chinese troops who recaptured the mainland port of Fuchao have pushed six miles to the east in an effort to pin the Japanese forces against the coast. Japanese Premier Suzuki, speaking to a Tokyo conference of officials who are concerned with affairs on the Asiatic mainland, urged them to strengthen Japan's war effort on the continent of Asia. In Europe, it's been officially announced at British Second Army headquarters that the city of Berlin will never again be the administrative and military capital of Germany. The official statement says Germany is to be decentralized, though not dismembered, and the object of the occupying forces is to control Germany, but not to govern directly. Trieste is tense. The troops continue their watchful waiting, and presumably the negotiations between Marshal Tito and the Western Allied governments are still going on. There have been disorders in Syria, where 17 persons were wounded in Damascus yesterday. Spanish General Franco has made a speech insisting that his totalitarian party is still strong. And now for our first switch to Colombia's correspondence abroad. Admiral takes you to Paris. Larry Lasser reporting. It's a typical Liberation Sunday in Paris. The tree-lined boulevards are crowded with French civilians in their Sunday best, and thousands of American soldiers on furlough, faces scrubbed and boots polished for the first time in months. The report from Washington that many more American troops may be held in Europe to give our diplomatic arguments more weight has been slowly passing about by word of mouth among the G.I.s. But since they've already been made fatalistic by the Army, this hasn't caused any great disappointment. Nobody is in a hurry to go to the Pacific, and besides, it's summer here in Europe, and it's pleasant just to sit around and loaf in the sunshine or toss a ball around in a typical American game of catch. Paris will be pleased to see the Americans around because they're slowly bringing some prosperity to the capital. The G.I.s are still showing no reluctance to spend their money on Paris souvenirs, although the prices are exorbitant at our rate of exchange. And since our army brought its own food over, we're taking very little away from the French, and we are providing a lot of trade in one way or another. But France is still a very sick country, and the recent influx of French prisoners of war is adding to her problems. After years in prison camp, these men are not satisfied with the conditions they found in their newly liberated homeland. One of the signs of Europe's sickness is that people are no longer willing to wait for things to happen. They want to go about doing things in their own sweet way. Here's an instance. Yesterday, the French police were evicting a non-rent payer by force. When the furniture was piled on the streets, a crowd of 400 former prisoners of war, still wearing their faded uniforms, broke through the police cordon and carried the furniture back from the sidewalk. Police reinforcements arrived and dispersed the newly freed prisoners and took the furniture to a storeroom. But no sooner had they stored it away than a truck full of prisoners arrived on the scene and once more seized the dispossessed belongings. Another prisoner went to a fashionable clothing store in the Rue de Rivoli and asked to see a civilian suit. When the tailor told him that there were no goods available, the former prisoner smashed the store window, grabbed a suit displayed there, and made off in the crowd. No one stopped him. That is the sort of discontent that abounds in chaotic Europe. While high-level diplomats hope that Europe will sit tight for a year or so until the peace conferences settle geographic questions in an orderly manner, the people of Europe simply will not sit still. 
In France, the recent municipal elections have shown the people's obvious discontent with highly conservative measures. We must do our best to furnish aid to these people to recover, or the prestige of highly organized systems may sweep across this continent. And this is Larry LeSir returning you now to Admiral in New York. And now a word from Warren Sweeney. There's a lot of listening pleasure in store for you when you get your post-war Admiral radio phonograph with Slide Away, the open door to good music. Admiral Slide Away is the exclusive Admiral feature that makes loading and unloading your automatic record changer so easy. With Slide Away, you'll simply open the radio cabinet doors and out will glide the complete Admiral record changer and phonograph turntable. They'll be so easy to reach right out in the open with no groping in a half-dark, hard-to-get-at compartment. Then, when you load your Admiral Changer with 10 or 12 of your favorite records and just sit back and hear them flawlessly played with the amazingly lifelike tone and reproduction that your new Admiral will give, you're going to say, they're right, Slide Away is the open door to good music. You'll have a wide choice of Admiral radio phonographs with automatic record changers and Slide Away with a fine selection of beautiful cabinets. And remember... You'll get Admiral Slide Away and Admiral Real Life Tone and Reproductions only in an Admiral Radio, America's smart set. Now, here's Robert Trout. Next, the news direct from Britain. Admiral takes you to CBS London, Bill Slocum Jr. reporting. This is Whitsuntide weekend, and for the first time in almost six years, the pale and weary people of London have climbed aboard trains for the sheer pleasure of going off somewhere to have a good time. Naturally, the weather, as it would be at home, is perfectly awful. There's an international cricket match going on at Lloyd's between Australia and England, and even that ancient British sport retains a distinct flavor of war. The big story is not in the score, but rather in the performance of a young Australian ex-prisoner of war whom I gathered struck out England's Bay Brute. The score, by the way, shows England with 267 and Australia with 82, which is termed by the British press a distinct Australian victory. For that reason alone, it might be best to drop the subject of cricket. Although the war in Europe is done, there is still a great amount of sudden death lurking in her waters and her ground. Almost 200 French children have already been killed by landmines, and Channel Island refugees in Britain will not be allowed to return home until a quarter million mines are removed from the waters surrounding the islands. Travel by boat across the channel, never too pleasant a journey at best, has been complicated by the grim reminder of Arlican guns fore and aft on the channel boats. These guns are used to explode floating mines. From personal experience yesterday, I can report that the Arlican gun was not much of an answer to the problem. We sighted two mines, and the gunners cut loose furiously but missed. And the mines were still bobbing along, unexploded, when last seen. England's somewhat self-conscious determination to enjoy her first peacetime holiday is complicated not only by the weather, but by her front pages. The goings-on in Trieste, the exchange of diplomatic double-talk and unsatisfactory notes has an all-too-familiar ring to British ears. There seems to be no disposition on the part of the British, however, to yield one inch to Tito and his friends. Mr. Churchill has another problem on his hands. He wants his coalition government continued until the defeat of Japan. The Labour Party is now meeting to decide whether it will go along. If it won't, Churchill is likely to refuse any compromise, such as an autumn election, and demand one within six or seven weeks. This is Bill Slocum, Jr. in London. I return you now to Admiral in New York. This week, the Navy released the story of the heroic struggle of the officers and men of the aircraft carrier Franklin, who brought their ship back to New York after she was very badly damaged off Japan. For an interview with one of the Franklin survivors, here is Alan Jackson. The story of the USS Franklin, aircraft carrier, is a story of courage and determination that will rank high in the annals of Navy history. One man who survived the disaster is Yeoman First Class Irving Kidwell of Washington, D.C., who's been recommended for the Bronze Star for his part in the heroic struggle. Irving, where were you when the Jap bomb went off? I was in the log room. That was right next to the hangar deck. And when the bomb went off, the force of it knocked me under a desk. The lights went out, and smoke started pouring in through the ventilation ducts. 
Well, what did you think had happened? From the way we shook, I first thought we'd been hit by a torpedo. But then when I started out, I saw how the bulkheads had been blown in and knew that it was a bomb. Well, Irving, where did you go when you left the log room? To the forward engine room, two decks below. My battle station was down there. So naturally, that was where I first hit him. But when I got down there, the smoke was so thick, I could hardly see anything. And it was pretty tough, just breathing until I got my gas mask on. But that didn't help too much. My job was to man the ship service telephone in the engine room. Our telephone was still working at the time, but apparently not many others were, because no calls were coming in. Well, after a while, that smoke down there must have become even worse. It did, and it was getting hotter, too. I saw several men leave and climb the ladder to the next deck. So in a couple of minutes, I followed them because the smoke and heat was just getting too much to take. How were things on that third deck above the engine room? A little better, but not for long. So I went aft and went up to the second deck. Was that the hangar deck? No, that's the one just below the hangar deck. I was trying to reach the hangar deck to get some fresh air. Well, then you didn't know at the time just what the situation was up there. No, but I soon found out. When a bunch of us started up there to the hangar deck, we found all the hatches closed. And we could hear everything blowing up. Bombs and rockets going off. So we didn't dare try to force the hatches open. It would have been suicide if we had. Well, then, what did you do? Nothing. There wasn't much we could do. We knew it was behind us, and we knew what was in front of us. So we just stayed there and prayed. My buddy and I lay down on the deck to get some fresh air... While we could, because smoke was gradually filling up our compartment. And altogether, how long were you there? About two and a half hours. By that time, some of the firefighting parties on the hangar deck had hosed down part of the fire and had reached the area of our hatch. And when they did, they heard some of of us pounding on the deck and realized that we were down there and opened it up. And from then on, for the next few days and nights, it was an endless job of fighting fires and caring for the wounded. Yes, and burying the dead. Two or three days later, I was lucky enough to get a little sleep. Three hours altogether. Thank you, Yeoman First Class Irving Kidwell, for your story of the USS Franklin, a gallant ship and a gallant crew. And now back to Robert Trout. Next, a report on the San Francisco Conference. Admiral takes you to San Francisco. George Murad reporting. While most of the conference delegates are out sightseeing this beautiful Sunday afternoon, the chiefs of the Big Five are slogging along at work. There seems to be a little more hope of progress after a week devoted mostly to inconsequential talk because now the Russian ambassador, Andrei Gromyko, is getting messages from Moscow and will probably be able to negotiate with more authority. The first of these Moscow instructions concerns the regional security issue and the right of territorial groups to take immediate action if they're attacked. The Inter-American plan concocted last week would permit regional groups to defend themselves if the world organization was unable to solve the problem. But the Russians say this if anticipates failure. They'd like to change the wording and withdraw the right of regional blocs to act when the world group is already taking action against an armed aggressor. No real trouble is anticipated since the Soviets, even more strongly than the Pan-American nations, have insisted that their bilateral treaties demanding immediate action from France, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia must not be weakened by any untried world agreement. The Russian substitution seems only to carry a difference in wording and not in substance, but people here are learning to examine all Soviet proposals with more than usual attention. While there's full recognition in these last days that the real indications of world insecurity, Trieste and Poland, have been transferred to other world capitals, and particularly Moscow, the result is increased desire to get this charter on paper in the quickest possible time. There's impatience with any further discussion of irrelevant or troublesome questions. There's impatience with any further discussion of irrelevant or troublesome questions which obviously cannot be solved here. South Africa's Prime Minister Smuts sounded that keynote last night in a CBS broadcast. He said, The plain fact is that some people are not satisfied 
with wrestling with the almost insoluble problem of world security against the dreadful scourge of war. They have a passion for reforming the world in general. I return you now to Admiral in New York. In the Mediterranean area, Field Marshal Alexander's statement on the Trieste dispute has been the big news of the week. For direct news on the Trieste disagreement, Admiral takes you to CBS Rome, Winston Burdett reporting. The Trieste crisis seems no closer to a solution following Field Marshal Alexander's message to his forces. Marshal Tito's retort from Belgrade does not indicate any intention to withdraw from northeast Italy. And here in Rome, I think it can be said that the Allied commander's reference to Hitler and Mussolini did not hurt the Yugoslav leader. Too many people feel that this was going very far with respect to an ally whom our military chiefs were congratulating a few days ago on his brilliant contribution to the common victory. In the midst of the Trieste controversy, two things are worth noting. The words powder keg and tinderbox are being free to use to describe Trieste, and people are asking whether what happened in Greece will happen again there. My own strong impression here in Rome is that while we sometimes talk as though we were looking for trouble, we do not want it. It would be at least as damaging for us on this occasion to intervene with force of arms as it would be for Tito to withdraw from the disputed area. A second fact worth recalling today is this. At various points in the negotiations between Alexander and Tito, various compromise proposals were suggested. There was the proposal that Tito place his troops in the Trieste area under Alexander's command. There was the understanding that Allied military government and Tito's civil administration would go in and run things together. The crisis has now reached a point where such compromise proposals are apparently forgotten. We've come to a stage of emotional controversy where we are saying do this and seem to have forgotten we're treating with an ally. Most of the Rome press is still in a state of high-pitched national fervor over Trieste. But obviously, the only way out is through negotiation and not by cracking the emotional whip. And negotiation usually means compromise. This is Winston Burdett in Rome, returning you now to Admiral. In this country, the international political developments are getting close attention. For a report on possible developments at Tangier and other news, Admiral takes you to CBS Washington, Tris Coffin reporting. The diplomatic spotlight is quietly turning to Tangier, hardly a speck on the world map. It is the international settlement across the Strait of Gibraltar from the Great British Fortress. This settlement is supposed to be under international control, but when France fell and it looked like the Axis was top dog, Spain grabbed control. An official at the State Department tells us that it is safe to predict a joint American-British move to push the Spaniards out of the saddle in Tangier. Some hard, cold facts gathered from all corners of the earth and reported by the Department of Agriculture today are serious news for American housewives. The survey shows that now, the time of the greatest world need for food, scorching droughts in South America, Africa, and Australia has seriously reduced production. The export of meat and dairy products from the southern hemisphere is expected to drop. Grain supplies are short. Additional information was given CBS World News by officials of the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. Europe is now producing 15 to 35 percent less food than normally. Many hundreds of acres are sown with German mines and cannot be used. There is a bad shortage of draft animals, a crying need for meat, milk, and egg animals, and a serious lack of fertilizer and insecticides. American food experts figure it'll take a crop year or two before European farming returns to normal. This gloomy picture will be reflected in American menus. For us, it means the day of more liberal food rations is a long way off. On Capitol Hill, a move is developing to spell out the rights and privileges of newsmen. Representative Wilkett of Michigan proposed today that Congress recognize the right of newsmen to keep their sources in confidence. I return you to Admiral in New York. In the week that has just passed, there was no more organized shooting in Europe, but there were still many military loose ends which must be tidied up. The building of the peace will require years, but much work remains to be done before the war is liquidated. 
Occasional explosions can still be heard today in Prague as Czech and Russian troops dig through the cellars of the city's houses, rounding up the last of the Germans. The Swedish radio says that in Denmark, two fortresses just outside the entrance to Copenhagen Harbor are still held by German troops, but these are expected to surrender soon. There are still German U-boats at large in the ocean, but their number decreases as they continue to sail into Allied harbors flying the surrender flag. The huge task of shifting the American and British forces from the continent to the Far East has now begun, but it will be a long time before the job is completed. Allied planes are still flying over Germany, but they carry no bombs. They're moving liberated prisoners, most of them, on the first steps to real freedom. And when the bomber crews are not flying, they're at work in the classrooms, in training for the long flight over the oceans to the Far East and to the new job. All over Europe, the Germans are slowly departing from the liberated countries. Mostly, they're marching out in good order, singing their songs of war. Colombia's correspondent Charles Shaw, who watched the Germans going from Norway and from Denmark, reports that some of them shouted, We'll be back in 20 years. The Allies have won the military victory over Germany, but no Allied official has ventured to predict that Germany will now become a peaceful nation without serious thought of revenge or another attempt at world domination. On the contrary, the governments of all the principal allies are proceeding on the assumption that Germany will try again, if not prevented from trying. There is enough force available to prevent another German war. The power of the United Nations was sufficient to smash Germany's ambitions when German strength was at its height. Obviously, the allies are powerful enough to control a defeated Germany, if they remain allies. These early days after the German surrender have demonstrated vividly that no secure peace can be built without a closer partnership among the great nations than has ever before been known in peacetime. Already, the immediate work of ruling Germany has been slowed because the big four nations have not yet agreed on such points as the boundaries of the occupation zones. There are differences and irritations at the places where Western and Eastern Europe meet, at Warsaw, Vienna, and Trieste. It is clear now that the amount of cooperation required to win a war is not enough to win a peace, and that the end of the shooting, far from permitting the alliance to be relaxed, actually requires the strengthening of the bonds that unite the United Nations. And now to tell you about a new flexible heat idea in electric ranges, here is Warren Sweeney. The post-war electric ranges by Admiral will have flexo heat. Admiral flexo heat is an ingenious, exclusive feature that makes it possible to get exactly the amount of heat you want just as easily as turning on or off a water faucet. Do you mean that I can get just the right amount of heat I want for any cooking operation? Right. No more and no less. You see, pre-war electric ranges had a certain number of fixed heat positions, usually three or five. When you turn the heat to the next hotter position, the amount of heat used was double that of the previous position. There could be no in-between temperature. But Admiral Flexo Heat changes all that. You'll be able to control every heating operation with your Admiral electric range. That sounds as if an Admiral range will be economical to operate. Yes, and besides its economy, you'll fall in love with its streamlined beauty, its cleanliness, and its two full-sized ovens. You can be sure that Admiral is going to make electric range history. For the best in cookery, use electricity. For the best in electric cookery, choose an Admiral. Today is I Am an American Day, a day for all of us to reaffirm our allegiance to the principles of American citizenship and for the democratic form of government under which we live. No better expression of our responsibilities of citizenship can be found than by our extra support of the mighty Seventh War Loan. Buy an extra bond today in appreciation of our American ideals. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by Admiral Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set, and post-war makers of Admiral dual-temp refrigerators, Admiral home freezers, Admiral electric ranges. Be sure to listen again next Sunday when Admiral brings you World News Today by shortwave, direct from leading news centers of the world. This is Warren Sweeney speaking coast to coast for Admiral. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, Rigby Building, Chicago.